Alrighty guys, so the goal of today's video is to provide a reference for those who are looking to make their first knife. I will be using multiple different tools and techniques for each operation so that you have options when tackling this project. Along with links to useful tools and supplies, I will be putting a link to the PDF plans for this knife in the description below. The first and likely the most crucial step for this project will be picking out the steel that you will be using to make this knife. I highly recommend using 1084 to make your first knife since it is very forgiving in the home heat treat. I recommend ordering a piece of steel that is an inch and a half wide by an eighth of an inch thick. The first step is going to be to get your design traced out onto the piece of steel and then cut it out. You can use a hacksaw to do much of this cutting or you can apply a couple different techniques. A technique that I used when I first started making knives was to drill holes around the profile of the knife and then cut in between those holes with either the hacksaw or a cutoff wheel on the Dremel tool. The ridges that are left behind can then be hand filed down so that they are flush with the profile of your design. While this method will work if all you have is a drill, a hacksaw, and the file, I would highly recommend getting your hands on a 4.5 inch angle grinder to speed up the process. Not only will you be able to cut out your blank faster, but you'll see later on the video that this 4.5 inch angle grinder is extremely versatile. To provide contrast, I will be showing the air quotes pro methods for some of these tasks. Here you can see the pro method is cutting out the profile of the knife on the bandsaw. This is obviously a step up from the drilling method. However, many people still prefer the angle grinder over the bandsaw for cutting out their blanks. Once we have the rough shape cut out, the next step is refining the profile of the knife. The angle grinder steps in as the cost efficient option here. However, you need to be careful when using it because you can take off too much material too fast. When using the angle grinder, I will angle grind down to close to my line and then use the hand file to get the rest of the dimension. While the angle grinder is nice to have in order to take off the bulk of the material, it is not necessary to refine the profile of your knife. Hand files can be employed alone to get your knife down to its target dimension. This will obviously take a bunch more time and a bunch of patience However, it is truly possible to do all of these tasks with just the hand files. Radiuses on the profile of your knife can be especially challenging. In this case, I'm using a half round file to get into the finger choil area. Another option would be to wrap a piece of sandpaper around something round. In this case, I'm using a wood dowel to wrap a piece of sandpaper around and then putting that dowel into my drill. This will help you get into some tight spots and you can vary the size of the dowels that you're using to wrap sandpaper around. While I did not show it here, another option would be to use the drum sander attachment for a Dremel tool to get into some of these tight spaces. The pro option, of course, is to use a belt sander and a table so that you can grind the profile down to your target dimensions. If you're looking to get into the game, even a 1x30 belt sander can speed up your process significantly. Using a Sharpie as marking fluid and some cheap dial indicators, I scribe some lines along the center of my knife handle. This will be where I will be drilling my holes. I'm going to eyeball the front and rear holes. These are going to be the holes that I'll actually put pins through, and I will drill those holes with an eighth of an inch drill bit. If you happen to have access to numbered bits, I would advise drilling a number 30 hole instead of an eighth of an inch hole so that you have a little more clearance for putting the pins in. These holes can easily be drilled with a steady hand and a hand drill. However, if you have access to a cheap drill press, that is a superior option. Once we have these holes drilled, we'll be drilling some additional holes that are larger so that our epoxy has some space to move in between the handle scales and to provide a little bit of weight reduction. This is a checkering file that I'll be using to apply the jimping on the spine of the knife. While this is not necessary, I do like the way that it looks aesthetically and it has a nice tactile feel on the thumb when using the knife. If you're interested in picking up one of these checkering files, I'll make sure to put a product link down below. The next step will be filing in our bevels. To do this, I mark where I want the bevels to line up on both sides of the knife with a triangular file, and then I get started on one side. I start off by using that triangular file and then move on to a very small needle file to get my groove started. Then I realize that before I get started, I need to mark my center line. There are three options I'll give you here to marking your center line. You can make a nice sweet jig like this that uses the sides of the knife as a guide. You can use a drill bit of the same diameter of the thickness of stock that you're using. Or you can use a height scribe like this one to mark your center lines. 
All three of these methods will provide you with a center line in your stock. Having the center line marked during the filing process will be crucial because you want the edge of your knife to end up in the center of the blade. Now I think the first time I ever saw anyone do this was on a Walter Soros video on making a knife with hand files. And this method is very effective in getting your plunge lines symmetrical when hand filing in your bevels. We're using a 3 16 of an inch chainsaw file to file in the plunge lines on both sides of the knife and then we will not touch these plunge lines with the straight files once we start filing the rest of the bevels. I found that it makes the blending process easier when going to the straight files if you don't go all the way up to where you want your bevels to be with the round file. So maybe a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch shy is your target. Even if you do have a cheap belt grinder, this filing technique is a good option to get your plunge lines lined up and then you can use the belt sander along the flats to remove the bulk of the material. I found that when I was just starting out, I was not good enough to have symmetrical grinds off of my grinder, so I would file in my plunge lines and then remove the bulk of the material with the grinder. After that, I would sure it up with the set of files. If hand files are your only option, this process will probably take you around three to four hours to file in your bevels on a reasonably sized knife. Your first method of attack should be to file in an aggressive angle down to your center line. This angle should be around a 45 degree angle. After you have both sides filed down to the center line and your edge is in the center of the knife, then you can start working that bevel back towards the spine. You will do this by gradually lessening your angle and then filing a new facet onto your bevel. Once this facet meets up with your edge, you can lessen your angle again until you hit the target height of your bevels. You can see here that I am halfway through this facet and I still have a ways to go before that facet meets up with the edge of the knife. So like I said, this is a very time consuming process. If you have an angle grinder, you can use it here to very carefully remove some material and then sure it up with the files. You can also use a contraption called a file guide, which I used in one of my previous videos, which will not only speed up the process, but also increase your level of precision with your files. When you're getting close to your final height, I like putting a piece of 120 grit sandpaper around my file to start blending in the plunge line area with the flats of the bevel. The pro option when beveling is to use a grinder with a flat platen or a wheel. However, using the files and sandpaper can give you the same results if you have time and patience. I'll mention here that your target edge thickness should be around 20 to 25 thousandths of an inch pre-heat treat so that you don't have any significant warps during the heat treat, but also so that you don't have so much material that it will take a long time to sand down. Lastly, I will file in a sharpening choil with the chainsaw file. In my last cheap tool knife build, I used a torch alone to heat treat the knife, and while it worked, I felt like the heat treatment was lacking. So this time around, I'll be building a two brick forge to do our heat treat in. These bricks are only about 30 bucks, and they're extremely easy to work with to make this forge. The general design for this forge came from Outdoors 55, so if you're going to be building one of these, I highly recommend you checking out his channel. On our little forge here, we're going to be having a chamber that measures around two and a quarter inch in diameter. Like I mentioned, this material is extremely easy to work with, and in reality, you can do all this work with a rasp or a file. I found that using the saws sped up the process greatly. My process on this chamber was to use the long saw to cut out the bulk of the material. Then I had this little, I think this is a drywall saw that I used for some of the fine work in between the big gashes. And finally, I would use just a normal file to smooth out the chamber so that it has a nice uh, smooth surface. The whole process of making this little forge took me around 45 minutes to an hour to complete. So there's not really a big time commitment. And a little bit of a spoiler alert, it makes the heat treat way better. Once we have our two halves created, we will then be marking out our burner hole location. I want the burner to be a little bit towards the front of the forge and pointed slightly backwards into the forge body. I'm going to be pointing it backwards around 20 degrees. I also want the burner to be pointed slightly up so that it can hit the wall at a tangent and create a nice swirl inside of the forge chamber. 
I once again use the saws to knock out the bulk of the material and then a file to clean up my hole until the burner nozzle fits. In order for the top piece and the bottom piece to line up, I will take the top piece and put it on the bottom piece and use an X-Acto knife to scribe the lines that I'll use as targets for my burner tube hole on the top piece. I'll then use my small saw to take out the bulk of the material and the files to get it to the final dimension. Once we're there, I'll do a brief test fit and then we'll get ready for the heat treating process. I took the forge and put it up on two blocks. I put a weight on top to make sure the two pieces stay together and I took some old fire brick I had to block off the back of the forge. You can see that the benzomatic map gas burner is pointed into the forge at a very slight angle. So this is the initial startup. I was actually quite impressed on how little time it took for this little forge to heat up. I used another fire brick, a hard fire brick on the front, just to allow it to heat up a little faster. And then I removed it so I can fit the knife into the chamber. To stick with the cheap nature of this knife build, I just used a pair of pliers to hold on to the tang of the knife. I'll get the knife up to a non-magnetic heat and then target around 100 to 200 degrees higher than that non-magnetic temperature before quenching it in oil. You can use canola oil, but in this case I use Parks 50. I then took two pieces of angle iron in my vise and clamped the knife down after a four to five second quench. This ensures that the knife cools in a straight orientation. To verify that I have a hard blade, I will file test it to see if the file skates across the blade or digs into it. If the file digs into the steel, that means that the steel is softer than the file and something went wrong during your heat treatment. This blade skated the file easily, so we will be clamping it between two pieces of angle iron to hold it straight and putting it into an oven for tempering. I will be tempering at 410 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 210 degrees Celsius, for two two-hour cycles. This can be done inside of a home range oven. However, if you're going to be doing this in your home oven, make sure that your preheat cycle does not have the knife in the oven because home appliances generally overshoot the temperature that you set them at on their first cycle. Once we're done tempering, the next step will be to make sure that the handle section of our knife is nice and flat. This will ensure that we have a very good epoxy bond when we put our handle scales onto the knife. The best way to do this without a fancy grinder or surface grinder is to find something flat and put a piece of sandpaper on top of it. In this case, I'm using a sink cutout, which is a piece of granite, but you can also use a piece of glass for this operation. After we finish the flats on the handle portion of our blank, we will then finish sanding the rest of the blade. If you want a nice, straight, crisp line, use a hard file behind your sandpaper, and if you want to wash out your lines and smooth everything over, you can use a rubber backing on your sandpaper. I've found that the smoother, softer backing is good once you get into the higher grits, and when you're in the lower grits, to use the hard backing to keep everything nice and crisp. It is at this point in the build that you have a plethora of options on how you want to finish out your knife. For the sake of this demonstration, I only brought this blade up to a 120 grit finish. However, a 600 grit finish is a good standard for a nice hand sanded satin finish. If I'm going to be etching a Damascus blade, I'll bring it up to a 600 to 1000 grit finish before etching. A lot of my stone washed finished knives I'll bring up to a 220 or a 320 grit J-Flex belt and then I'll hit it with a scotch Bright belt to make everything nice and smooth before etching it and stone washing it. If you really enjoy torturing yourself, you can bring your blade up to around a 3000 grit finish, hit it with a light buff, and then have yourself a mirror finish. My point here is that you have a lot of options and you should play around with the different finishes that you like on your knives. I mentioned it before, but I did not show it, so I'll be showing it here. This is my soft backing sanding block. It is basically just a piece of wood with a very thin piece of rubber glued onto it. This will soften out your grind lines if that is the desired finish that you're shooting for. Once we have the blade up to our desired finish, we will pick out our handle scales. To make the amount of material that we have to remove as minimum as possible, we will be using quarter inch thick handle scales for this build. I had three materials here, and since this video was being filmed in October, I feel like the green material was appropriate for the Halloween season. As far as good handle materials go, you're going to have a lot of opinions out there. I generally like recommending G10 and Micarta since they are non-porous and they will not warp or shrink down the road. 
However, if you're going to use wood, just make sure to use a nice stable wood. So we get everything clamped up here and we're going to use the knife as a drill guide to drill all the way through both of our scales. You can either use the hand drill or the drill press like I showed there. I got this brazing rod from our local big box store. I got this from Lowe's and it's just an eighth of an inch brazing rod. They're very cheap to find. Like I mentioned earlier in the build, we have to take this brass one eighth of an inch rod down a little bit in outside diameter so that it easily fits in our eighth of an inch hole. If you drill the number 30 hole, this would not be an issue. Lastly, I'll use a carbide tipped scribe to go ahead and mark out the profile of our handle scales and then I will rough in where the front radius of the handle scales will be. To cut out our handle scales, we have a few options here. You can see my first cut, I used a hacksaw. While this would work if you had some patience, I found it to be pretty cumbersome to cut the G10 with the hacksaw. If you have a lot of time, you can use a file or maybe a rasp to file down to your final dimension. The best low cost option I found was using an angle grinder with a flap disc on it to take down the bulk of the material. If you're using micarta, be extremely careful because micarta will burn easily. I did not find the G10 had any issues with burning. Once you get the bulk of the material down, you can use a file to true up your lines. You can also try to use the drill and cut method. While this works, I found it more cumbersome than it was worth, and the angle grinder, once again, was a much better solution. But just for demonstration purposes, I will drill some holes and cut in between them here to show how it would work. Many of y'all probably already know this, but the four and a half inch angle grinder is an extremely versatile piece of equipment that every home shop should have anyway. So go over to Amazon or Harbor Freight and get one for 30 bucks and be happy that you did. And as y'all guessed it, the quote unquote pro method for doing this operation would be to use the belt sander with the work rest to grind down to your target lines. Once you have achieved your target dimension, we will be addressing the front of the handle scales. Generally, I will grind these on my belt grinder with a 45 degree angle jig. However, in this case, I'm going to freehand it with the angle grinder. I take off the bulk of the material with the angle grinder up to my penciled in line, and then I use files and sandpaper to clean up these bevels on the front of my handles. You want to take the finish on the front of these handle scales up to whatever finish you plan on putting on the rest of the handle. In this case, I brought them up to a 600 grit finish, but I ended up stopping at a 320 grit finish on the rest of the handle. This is not a big deal. It's always better to aim high uh, than aim low on the front of these scales because it will give you some leeway in the future. Lastly, before the glue up process, I make sure that the insides of the scales are nice and flat. We will be using G-Flex epoxy for our handle, and it is known as the gold standard for knife handle epoxies. I have tested it in two separate videos against two different manufacturers, and I feel like this epoxy is one of the best out there for putting together a knife. You'll basically coat both scales in the knife itself and push your eighth of an inch pins through, then clamp the entire assembly. Be very careful during this step of the process, especially if using twist clamps, not to over clamp your knife handles. If you over clamp the handle, you will push the epoxy out of the joint and have a bad joint. So very softly clamp the handles. Spring clamps are a good option here since they will not over clamp your knife handle. Once you have given the epoxy 24 hours to cure, it is time to finish out your handle. I like to wrap the blade with some paper towels and tape so that I do not scratch the finish that we were just working on. The next step is to cut off the pins or clip off the pins in my case and grind them down so that they are flush with the handle scales on both sides. I used the angle grinder and files to do this operation, but also demonstrated how you could use a Dremel tool to knock these pins down flush with the handle scales. Once you have the pins flush on both sides, you want to get the handle scales flush with the spine of the knife along the profile. You want to be a little careful here not to be too aggressive and take big divots out of the metal profile of your knife because it will be very difficult to fix at this part of the process. So I used the angle grinder to take up the bulk of the material and then when I got close I transitioned it to some 120 grit sandpaper to sand the scales down to the spine gently. Once again the angle grinder does speed up this process 
but it's easy to make mistakes with this fast moving piece of equipment. You could accomplish this entire task with a good set of files and rasps. To get into the finger choil area, I found that the Dremel tool was a very nice solution. However, the sandpaper wrapped around the dowel would also do very good for this area on the knife. Like the blade finishes we talked about earlier, there are multiple different handle shaping and sculpting techniques and people have their personal preferences. I wanted to provide a guide here on a fairly simple method for making a comfortable handle. The first step is, like I mentioned, getting the handle scales down to the spine, and then we will be putting a 45 degree angle around the top and the bottom of the handle scales. To achieve this, we carefully use the angle grinder to take off the bulk of the 45 degree angle material, and then we use hand files with a hard backer to clean up both sides of these 45 degree angles. Once I did the top and the bottom of the handle scales, I found that this knife actually felt pretty good in the hand with just these 45 degree bevels on the top and bottom of the scales. So once you get the 45 degree angles cut in to the top and bottom of your handle scales, you can stop there, bring the knife up to your desired handle finish grit on the sandpaper and call it a day. I actually did this recently on my Damascus knife build that I will link in the cards above. Using some sandpaper and just your fingers, you can knock down the hard edge along the very back of the knife. And I found that if you leave this edge there, it doesn't feel good in the hand. So like I said before, this actually feels pretty good in the hand and you could quit here, but we are going to use the drum sander attachment on our Dremel tool and add some creative scalloping to our handle scales. I've never used this method before, so I figured this demonstration knife would be a good opportunity for me to play with it. Using the drum sander attachment, I put around a 45 degree scallop across the entire top of the handle scales and then on the bottom set I would offset them so that the peak of the scallop on the bottom will match up with the middle of the scallop on the top. So uh, that's a little hard to explain but you can see from the video here what I'm talking about. So I'll mention it here if I was doing this method again I would use a ruler and a pencil to mark out the location of each one of these scallops. I found that not only were they not evenly spaced on the same side of the knife, but when I went and did the other handle scale, I did not get the scallops lined up across the top of the knife. So if you look hard enough, you can see that they're slightly offset from each other, and I did not like that result. However, I really did like the way the handle feels in the hand after it has been scalloped, so I probably will be doing this method again in the future. Once the scallops are in on both sides of the handle, I will take some sandpaper just with my hands and smooth over all of the hard edges on each side of the knife. And that's it for the handle. The next step is to sharpen the blade. Everyone has their own way they like to sharpen their knives. I generally use a whetstone sharpening system. Some people like sharpening on their belt sander. Others use an Edge Pro or a Wicked Edge. In this case, I'm just using a normal diamond stone and then stropping it with a piece of leather. So that pretty much concludes this guide. I hope this video gave you all some inspiration in making your first knife and also provided you with some different techniques that you can use to employ on your first knife build. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button down below and consider subscribing to the channel. If you have any questions during your first knife build, put them down below and I'll do my best to answer them. Until the next time, I'll catch you all on the flip side.